all the closest people in my life, I was going to have to go and tell my testimony to them personally. So that's what I did over the next three or four weeks is I went to every friend and family member that I'm even somewhat close to, met with them in person, and told them the story that I just told you. And um, one of those people were Tara, my current wife. Now, Tara and I had dated about six months prior to this for about nine months. And we had a beautiful relationship, long walks, everything was great. Um, you know, she had a couple of issues, and I always thought the grass was greener on the other side, and I wasn't patient, and I ended up breaking up with her about four months prior to me being saved. And uh, But she was still one of the people that I wanted to ha have know the truth of this world, because she was agnostic when I was with her. So I went to her and told her my testimony for no other reason than I wanted her to know the truth. I knew in that car ride that I wasn't going to be going to bars anymore, that I wouldn't be getting girls' phone numbers, that I wouldn't be dating people, that God was the only one who can create true love and put somebody into your life, and that's the only way to do it. So I knew, so I wasn't going there for that reason, I just was going to tell her this story. And so I told her the story, and she'll tell you today that when I left there, she did one of these on her forehead and said, wow, I really dodged a bullet there, that guy's lost his mind. <laughs> so. So, uh, and she said that was a great relief because she could finally completely just get me out of her mind and get over me and move on with her life. So, um, now the other thing that I had been doing since my drive in Nashville was I realized that I had taken love for granted in my life a lot up until this point. And I fully expected God to, um, not allow me to love somebody again for a long time, just out of retribution or whatever. You know, my understanding of God isn't what it is today, but it made sense to me that you don't just keep getting blessings over and over again when you throw them out the door. So ever since Nashville, I had been praying profusely every night that God would give me another chance to love again. And uh, after I met with Tara, a few days later, I was reading the book of Revelations, and I had heard about how these Bible verses could jump off the page to you in different times of your life help you in your life, but it hadn't happened to me up until this point. So I'm sitting there reading the book of Re Revelations, and one of the letters to the church is it, it says, go back to the way that you loved before. And it just hit me like a ton of bricks that it was talking about terror. Now, I was looking at this situation like, okay, I know what that means, but I can't just go jumping back into Tara's life. It would be so selfish of me to do this after, you know, breaking her heart. She's living with somebody. I can't just go in there, barge in there like that. So two weeks go by, and she never leaves my heart and never leaves my mind for one minute. And it just becomes overwhelmingly clear to me that God wants me to tell her how I feel. So I send her an email, and about two days later, I get a text message from her saying, I just read your email, it's really thrown me for a loop. And as I'm reading that text message, I look to my right and her current boyfriend is waiting at the, at the we live in the same building. Okay, we live in the same building, so I, I should put that out there. As I, as, I get, as I get that text message, I look to my right and her current boyfriend is waiting in the car to pick her up to go on a date. And I had known enough about God in this world at this point to know that when coincidence happens, that there is no coincidence. That when coincidence happens, God is waving at you. He's telling you that you're either doing what he wants you to do, just like he did through Larry when this started, or he's, he's telling you you're on the right track. It's, it's from God. So I, when I, that happened, I knew I was doing the right thing. And over the next... You know, then we met and talked, and it went well. And so over the next two weeks, we had this tumultuous period of her protecting her heart and me trying to tell her I've changed and everything's going to be okay. And so now still since Nashville, I'm still rationalizing the premarital sex thing, hoping that that's a mistranslation in the Bible and uh, just chalking it up to stuff. And Finally, one day, I called my mom and I said, Mom, where the heck does it actually say that you can't have premarital sex in the Bible? And she says to me, don't you know what uh, fornication is? And I had read all about fornication in the Bible up to this point, but never bothered to look it up. I just figured that fornication sounds like such an ugly word, there's no way it could, it could describe anything that I've ever done. So she says to me, don't you know what fornication is? And I say, uh, 
I say, no. She's like, well, maybe you should look that up. So then I look that up, and it's clear as day what fornication is. And that's about a week into this uh, tumultuous period with Tara. So now I come to this realization, and I have to go tell Tara that if we get back together, that we will not be having sex. Now, I know this doesn't help my chances at her. <laughs> but I also know that I can't allow her to sit here and be making this decision, make this decision, and then drop this on her, that that just wouldn't be fair. So I go to, we go to the park together, we're sitting there talking, and I tell her, you know, what the, all about, you know, this fornication and this situation, and as soon as I get the words out of my mouth, I realize that this just went from, hey, let's get back together and see how things go, to, hey, you know, if we get back together, I'm seriously considering marrying you, is what I've just heightened this conversation and this situation to. So, she, I tell her, she doesn't have any major reaction to it, and we uh, try to just go on with her day. About a week later, I'm walking out of Willow Creek in Chicago, and I get a text message from her that says, I love you, I'm sorry I question what we have, I want to be with you. And I just race home, we hug, kiss, and embrace, and it was just the most amazing feeling I've ever felt in my life. I felt an energy like I'd never felt in my life. And so then, the next thing was, Justin, do I have to believe to be with you? Now, I knew exactly what the Bible said about mixed yokes, but I also didn't want her to just believe because I believe. So I was telling her little white lies that, no, you don't have to believe for us to be together. You don't have to do anything for us to be together. And, you know, I looked at it as, if God's taking me down this path, if he's taking me down this road and with her, that he absolutely has a plan for her, and there's no reason for me to have to put this prerequisite on our relationship. So that's what I did. So over the next two or three weeks, she's asking me questions. She can see a physical change in me from the Holy Spirit. That is the most powerful thing that happened in her life, is that she's just like, Justin, what? something's different. And I'm like, it's the Holy Spirit. It's real. This is what I'm trying to tell you. She's reading the Bible from time to time. We're going out to Bering. I'm specifically going to Barrington, Willow Creek, because it's so, such a powerful sense of the Holy Spirit there. I'm taking her there. And one day, we uh, are going out to Barrington, and also that night, we're going to hear John Bevere speak at another church. So I'm giving her like a one-two punch. And uh, <laughs> first she hears a, a speech by Bill Hybels at, at Willow, who, if, you know, I believe if, if scripture was being written today, that he'd be one of the most powerful figures in Christianity in the last 500 years. And she comes to tears hearing this speech from Bill. So then... We go to, uh, uh, I can never remember the name of the church in Orland Park, but um, to hear John Bevere speak. And at the end of John Bevere's speech, um, he says, everybody bow their head. There's about 500 people there. And he says, anybody who'd like to give your life to Christ today, raise your hand. So I'm just sitting there not thinking much of it. And all of a sudden, Tara's hand goes up. And I start breathing a little heavy. And I can't believe that she's raising her hand in front of 500 people because she's about the most uh, timid, shy person you'll ever meet in your entire life. And I can't believe that her hand's up at this point. So John then says, anybody who'd like to, who's got their hand up who'd still get, like to give their life to Jesus Christ, please stand up. And at this point, I want to go up on stage and show him because there's no <laughs> way she's going to stand up in front of all these people. She stands up. I start breathing heavier. Tears are coming down my eyes. John then says, anybody who's standing up that would still like to give your life to Jesus Christ, please come up to the front of the stage. And now I'm just like... You're killing me here. You know? <laughs> All of a sudden, after about a minute, she starts walking up to the front of the stage and just bursts out in tears of joy. And all you can hear is Tara over the entire church crying her eyes out, giving her life to Jesus Christ. And that was about um, that was you know about June something. Um, uh, no, a little bit before June. That must have been middle of May. And then on June first, I asked her to marry me. And then we were married in Big Sur, California, uh, 